Welcome to Fortune Forecasts, and I am your hostess, Daisy Raisler. We started this new series titled Thought Vibration, or the Law of Attraction in the Thought World, by William Walker Atkinson, and it was published by the New Thought Publishing Company in 1906. In Chapter 1, Atkinson was laying down the foundation about the similarities in the issue that thought is vibration, yet also there are different other vibrations that we now have been able to understand such as the vibration of light and that even now there are some spectrums of light that our eyes can't see but does that mean that they're not there but science is saying that they are there's also different vibrations of heat and even sound that we as humans can't capture but does it mean that it's not there So they're also laying down the foundation for us to understand that there have been experiments in telepathy that have been able to prove that law of thought as it is an attraction, whether it's there were experiments done whether the person was in the vicinity or away from the person. So the wireless telegraphy of the mind, if that's pretty much what this telepathy would be. And so talking about like attracts like in the thought world so if you have positive thoughts you're going to start attracting positive things in your life and that they have already demonstrated that if you have negative thoughts negative thoughts seem to bring on the negative pattern and attracting its like so as we move on now to chapter two let's see what else will be revealed. Chapter 2 Thought Waves and Their Process of Reproduction Like a stone thrown into the water, thought produces ripples and waves which spread out over the great ocean of thought. There is this difference, however. The waves on the water move only on a level plane in all directions whereas thought waves move in all directions from a common center, just as do the rays from the sun. Just as we here on earth are surrounded by a great sea of air, so are we surrounded by a great sea of mind. Our thought waves move through this vast mental ether, extending, however, in all directions as I have explained, becoming somewhat lessened in intensity according to the distance traversed because of the friction occasioned by the waves coming in contact with the great body of mind surrounding us on all sides. These thought waves have other qualities differing from waves on the water. They have the property of reproducing themselves. In this respect, they resemble sound waves rather than waves upon the water. Just as a note of the violin will cause the thin glass to vibrate and sing, so will a strong thought tend to awaken similar vibration in minds attuned to receive it. Many of the stray thoughts which come to us are but reflections or answering vibrations to some strong thought sent out by another. But unless our minds are attuned to receive it, the thought will not likely affect us. If we are thinking high and great thoughts, our minds acquire a certain keynote corresponding to the character of the thoughts we have been thinking. And this keynote, once established, we will be apt to catch the vibrations of other minds keyed to the same thought. On the other hand, 
Let us get into the habit of thinking thoughts of an opposite character, and we will soon be echoing the low order of thought emanating from the minds of thousands of thinking along the same line. We are largely what we have thought ourselves into being, the balance being represented by the character of the suggestions and thought of others, which have reached us either directly by verbal suggestions or telepathically by means of such thought waves. Our general mental attitude, however, determines the character of the thought waves received from others as well as the thoughts emanating from ourselves. We receive only such thoughts as are in harmony with the general mental attitude held by ourselves, the thoughts not in harmony affecting us very little as they awaken no response in us. The man who believes thoroughly in himself and maintains a positive, strong mental attitude of confidence and determination is not likely to be affected by the adverse and negative thoughts of discouragement and failure emanating from the minds of other persons in whom these last qualities predominate. At the same time, these negative thoughts, if they reach one whose mental attitude is pitched on a low key, deepen his negative state and add fuel to the fire which is consuming his strength or if you prefer this figure serve to further smother the fire of his energy and activity we attract to us the thoughts of others of the same order of thought the man who thinks success will be apt to get into tune with the minds of others thinking likewise and they will help him and he them. The man who allows his mind to dwell constantly upon thoughts of failure brings himself into close touch with the minds of other failure people, and each will tend to pull the other down still more. The man who thinks that all is evil is apt to see much evil, and will be brought into contact with others who will seem to prove his theory. And the man who looks for good in everything and everybody, will be likely to attract to himself the things and people corresponding to his thought. We generally see that for which we look. You will be able to carry this idea more clearly if you will think of the Marconi wireless instruments, which receive the vibrations only from the sending instrument which has been attuned to the same key. While other telegrams are passing through the air in near vicinity without affecting the instrument. The same law applies to the operation of thought. We receive only that which corresponds to our mental attunement. If we have been discouraged, we may rest assured that we have dropped into a negative key and have been affected not only by our own thoughts but have also received the added depressing thoughts of similar character which are constantly being sent out from the minds of other unfortunates who have not yet learned the law of attraction in the thought world. And if we occasionally rise to the heights of enthusiasm and energy, how quickly we feel the inflow of the courageous, daring, energetic, positive thoughts being sent out by the live men and women of the world. We recognize this without much trouble when we come in personal contact with people and feel their vibrations, depressing or invigorating, as the case may be. But the same law operates when we are not in their presence, although less strongly. The mind has many degrees of pitch, ranging from the highest positive note to the lowest negative note, with many notes in between, varying in pitch according to their respective distance from the positive or negative extreme. When your mind is operating along positive lines, you feel strong, buoyant, bright, cheerful, happy, confident, and courageous, and are enabled to do your work well, to carry out your intentions, and progress on your road to success. You send out strong positive thought which affects others and causes them to cooperate with you or to follow your lead. 
according to their own mental keynote. When you are playing on the extreme negative end of the mental keyboard, you feel depressed, weak, passive, dull, fearful, cowardly. And you find yourself unable to make progress or to succeed. And your effect upon others is practically nil. You are led by rather than leading others and are used as a human doormat or football by more positive persons. In some persons, the positive element seems to predominate, and in others, the negative quality seems to be more in evidence. There are, of course, widely varying degrees of positiveness and negativeness, and B may be negative to A, while positive to C. When two people first meet, there is generally a silent mental conflict in which their respective minds test their quality of positiveness and fix their relative position toward each other. This process may be unconscious in many cases, but it occurs nevertheless. The adjustment is often automatic, but occasionally the struggle is so sharp, the opponents being so well matched that the matter forces itself into the consciousness of the two people. Sometimes both parties are so much alike in their degrees of positiveness that they practically fail to come to terms, mentally. They never really are able to get along with each other and they are either mutually repelled and separate or else stay together amid constant broils and wrangling. We are positive or negative to everyone with whom we have relations. We may be positive to our children our employees and dependents, but we are at the same time negative to others to whom we occupy inferior positions or whom we have allowed to assert themselves over us. Of course, something may occur and we will suddenly become more positive than the man or the woman to whom we have heretofore been negative. We frequently see cases of this kind. And at the knowledge of these mental laws becomes a more general, we will see many more instances of persons asserting themselves and making use of their newfound power. But remember, you possess the power to raise the keynote of your mind to a positive pitch by an effort of the will. And of course, it is equally true that you may allow yourself to drop into a low negative note by carelessness or a weak will. There are more people on the negative plane of thought than on the positive plane. And consequently, there are more negative thought vibration in operation in our mental atmosphere. But happily for us, this is counterbalanced by the fact that a positive thought is infinitely more powerful than a negative one. And if by force of will, we raise ourselves to a higher mental key, we can shut out the depressing thoughts and may take up the vibrations corresponding with our changed mental attitude. This is one of the secrets of the affirmations and auto suggestions used by several schools of mental science and other new thought cults. There is no particular merit in affir affirmations of themselves, but they serve a twofold purpose. One, they tend to establish new mental attitudes within us and act wonderfully in the direction of character building, the science of making ourselves over. Two, they tend to raise the mental keynote so that we may get the benefit of the positive thought waves of others on the same plane of thought. Whether or not we believe in them, we are constantly making affirmations. The man who asserts that he can and will do a thing and asserts it earnestly develops in himself the qualities conductive to the well-doing of that thing and at the same time places in his mind in the proper key to receive all the thought waves likely to help him in the doing. If, on the other hand, one says and feels that he is going to fail, he will choke and smother the thoughts coming from his own subconscious mentality, which are intended to help him, and at the same time will place himself in tune with the failure thought of the world. And there is plenty of the latter kind of thought around, I can tell you. 
Do not allow yourselves to be affected by the adverse and negative thoughts of those around you. Rise to the upper chambers of your mental dwelling and key yourself up to a strong pitch. Way above the vibrations on the lower planes of thought. Then you will not only be immune to their negative vibrations, but will be in touch with the great body of strong positive thought coming from those of your own plane of development. My aim will be to direct and train you in the proper use of thought and will, that you may have yourself well in hand and may be able to strike the positive key at any moment you may feel it necessary. It is not necessary to strike the extreme note on all occasions. The better plan is to keep yourself in a comfortable key without much strain and to have the means at command whereby you can raise the pitch at once when occasion demands. By this knowledge, you will not be at the mercy of the old automatic action of the mind, but may have it well under your own control. Development of the will is very much like the development of a muscle, a matter of practice and gradual improvement. At first, it is apt to be tiresome, but at each trial, one grows stronger until the new strength becomes real and permanent. Many of us have made ourselves positive under sudden calls or emergencies. We are in the habit of bracing up when occasion demands, but by intelligent practice, you will be so much strengthened that your habitual state will be equal to your bracing up stage now. And then, when you find it necessary to apply spur, you will be able to reach a stage not dreamed of at present. Do not understand me as advocating a high tension continuously. This is not all desirable, not only because it is apt to be too much of a strain upon you, but also because you will find it desirable to relieve the tension at times and become receptive that you may absorb impressions. It is well to be able to relax and assume a certain degree of receptiveness, knowing that you are always able to spring back to the more positive state at will. The habitually strongly positive man loses much enjoyment and recreation. Positive, you give out expressions. Receptive, you take impressions. Positive, you are a teacher. Receptive, a pupil. It is not only a good thing to be a good teacher, but it is also very important to be a good listener. And with that, we conclude chapter two. Wow. Are you ready to move on to chapter three? Leave me a comment. Let me know what you found interesting in chapter two. Come on, let's go now to chapter three.